Okay, so welcome to the William M. Starko Planetarium at Parkland College. Uh, this is our last edition of Winter Prairie Skies for 2021. We're going to have another show in two weeks, but that will be after the vernal equinox uh, when, the, when the sun is going to start favoring the northern hemisphere. Um, and for the February that we experienced, I'm guessing that for a lot of you, that's a very welcome change. But we've had a pretty warm week, haven't we? So we've gotten a pretty good early taste of spring. Um, I'm glad you can join me. Uh, my name is Eric Johnson. I'm the director of the Starco Planetarium. Uh, looks like I'm flying solo tonight. My uh, producer, Waylena McCulley, uh, she, she works with me here at the Planetarium. She is uh, taking some needed time away from work right now. Um, so I hope she's uh, getting a good chance to relax. Um, what I'd like you folks to do, if you can, is uh, feel free to pop any questions or observations you like into the chat, open that up for yourselves, or you can put questions in the Q&A and I'll be happy to share those with you as well. Um, I'd love to see what feedback you folks have and I'll do my best to observe what's going on there. All right. Um, as for what I'm wearing, uh, you might notice that I've actually got a tie showing a whole bunch of constellations on it. I got this a few years ago. I love it. I actually also have a pair of socks that actually has some constellations on them too. Um, so maybe you can actually identify a few of these on here, but they also have some labels too. Um, but I'm not bringing you here to just look at neckties. I wanted to actually have you see some of the night sky. So let me go ahead and before I go off onto some tangents, I will actually show you how we're going to be looking at the uh, night sky tonight. Yeah, Leo is on there. Excellent point, Ellie. Good job. All right. Um, so the main way that I use on my computer to share the night sky is a piece of software called Stellarium. Um, I'm going to put the simple URL of this into the, uh, into the chat right here. Stellarium.org. Uh, this is a great way for you to all simulate the night sky. And if you've got a clear night, I recommend that you make your best effort to step outside and have a good look at the night sky. And one way you can get a good point of reference for looking at what you'll see in the evening sky is if you maybe use one of the star charts. Uh, Waylena has made these star charts for anybody to go and print off for themselves. Uh, there's a link to it right there. Um, all you have to do when you have one of those star charts, I actually have one right over here. It's out of date. That's okay. You'll forgive me for holding up one from the summer of 2020, right? So there you see that. Notice that you've got north up at the top, you've got south at the bottom. That's great. But you see that over here, here's east and here's west. The reason why is because you're supposed to hold it over your head. And when you're oriented with north-south, you'll see east to your left and west to your right. Um, and so that's a great way to see how the sky would look. And like I said, this one's out of date, but up on our website, you can see our star charts even for this spring. So you'll be all set for those sorts of things. Let me stop cutting my head off there. All right, oh, that's the top of the, uh, of the green screen behind me. That's okay. All right. So I said I'd promise I'd show you Stellarium, and here it comes. All right. So those of you who were on here for the last couple minutes when I was on Facebook Live, you saw a little bit of this uh, in Stellarium here. I'm going to take this off because I just think it looks better that way. Um, it gives you a view of what the planetarium would look like at night right there. Maybe a little bit more lit up, but that is how this is trying to animate it. And we've got quite the view of the sky here. Now, um, my big recommendation for when you folks are going out to look at the night sky, if you really want to drink it in, uh, I would suggest that you find a place outside of town away from the light pollution to look up at the night sky. Uh, some great examples to consider, especially now that things are getting warmer and less muddy or snow covered, um, are to go some, to some of the forest preserves. Um, either near your home or around Champaign County or wherever you can go. Um, in Champaign, we actually have an International Dark Sky Park up at Middle Fork River Forest Preserve. So that's one great option you could consider. Um, another one, and this one I actually have a photograph to share with you. Uh, we're going to change our landscape to CUAS Observatory, uh, the Prairie Winds Observatory southwest of Champaign. Um, basically between Tolono and Sidoris. It's not that far of a drive out. 
Um, and when you look here, you see that you are in the middle of the farmland. Uh, you can see there are some buildings right there. Uh, the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society, they actually have some telescopes housed in there and they do share those with the public uh, during times when we can uh, comfortably be near each other and are not so worried about a pandemic. Um, but other than that, because you're outside of town, the skies are noticeably darker. You have no trouble seeing things like the Milky Way when you get out there. Okay, um, now this evening, uh, right after sunset, there's really only one planet you can see up in the sky after sunset. And since I mentioned it, I should bring it up. I'll show you how you can find it uh, really easily. Let's go first to the uh, most recognizable constellation in the night sky, um, in my opinion. And I say this also because um, this is a constellation you can easily see from much of both the northern and southern hemispheres. So I'm going to click on this star right here. And in, in this constellation, let's see if this works. Oh, there we go. You see three stars in a line right there. And you see this star here. It's kind of reddish. Maybe you might just see it as beige. There's a bright bluish star down here. And the artwork here shows you who we're looking at. You see it's a guy who's got apparently a pelt right there. I see somebody in the chat says Orion. That's right, Ellie. Yeah, you're looking at the constellation Orion right here. So because of the extremely bright stars of Orion, you should have no trouble seeing this up in the night sky. And if you're curious about where we're looking right now, we're looking uh, just a little bit west of south at this moment, uh, right at about seven o'clock. Um, so it's starting to set a little bit earlier as we get into spring, but you should have no trouble seeing it coming up later into the spring, um, and it's always worth uh, checking out. Uh, let me show you a couple of things you can find in the constellation of Orion while we're there. You'll notice I mentioned seven stars, but you can see some other bright point of light right below Orion's belt. I'm going to focus on that right now. If you get in closer here, you will find that next to those bright stars, you can see something a little cloudy in that spot. And it's kind of purplish, which is really cool to see. What you are looking at right there, I'm gonna make this a little bit easier to catch. You are looking at what we call the Great Orion Nebula. Now, I would tell you that even when you've got a little bit of light pollution, you should be able to see this with your own eyes. Those bright stars at the middle of the Orion Nebula, those are bright enough to catch with your own eyes, okay? And if you've got a pair of binoculars, this is a really easy object to catch and it's well worth the trouble looking at it. So if you find Orion's belt, look below it, look at the Great Orion Nebula. It's a great binocular object to behold. You're probably not gonna see it looking so purple in the way that this photograph is, is uh, presenting to you right here. This is showing you a mix of scattered starlight um, from those extremely hot, bright, very young stars. Um, that's the blue that you see there. And then the red is coming from the gas that gets heated up so much that electrons actually get stripped away from those atoms. So you have what we call emission spectra right there. So it's a little bit of a mix of those two things. Um, and the reason why all of this light is coming up, those hot young bright stars, they were actually just recently born. Um, a lot of astronomers like to refer to the Orion Nebula as a stellar nursery. Okay, so this is a place where you find newborn stars. And then there's also places very close by where some of that gas is actually being collapsed to form new stars. So it's also a star forming region right there too. Um, so these are places that are being intensely studied when we wanna learn more about how stars and also planets can actually form throughout our galaxy. Okay, so that is the Orion Nebula right there. All right, now, Going from the Orion Nebula, I told you I was gonna to get to a planet, but I did not want to ignore the brightest star in the night sky. You can see it just over to the left of Orion's belt, this bright star down here. And yeah, it is actually the brightest star in the night sky. That's mainly because of how close it is to us. This star is known as Sirius. 
For those of you Harry Potter fans, you might be pretty familiar with the star, aren't you? Okay. Um, and if you remember the character Sirius in the Harry Potter novels, you might remember that he was able to actually change his form into an animal. And if you remember what that animal is here, well, if you're not sure, let's see if I can do this for you. I'm going to connect the dots so you see what constellation Sirius is in. Ooh, what do you think that looks like right there? I think that looks like, you know, maybe it's one of Orion's pets. You are seeing a dog right there, not just any dog, a big dog. Yeah, it could be a fox. That's a very reasonable guess. I don't know how many foxes are domesticated though, okay? Um, but yeah, this is the big dog right there and its name is Canis Major. That's its Latin name, which just means big dog, okay? So Sirius, the character in the Harry Potter novels turns into a dog and that's because Sirius the dog star is part of the big dog constellation, all right? So that's what you're seeing right there. Okay, um, now we're gonna go off to the right this time from Orion's belt and we're gonna have, yeah, you could have a tiger, that's very reasonable. And Orion probably does need some help because take a look over to the right here. We follow the line of Orion's belt and you see this nice V shape right there. And actually just past the V, that will be the planet we're gonna be looking at. But I'm betting you're wondering what constellation this V happens to be a part of. Now, I like to not give this stuff away, so I'm gonna turn that off right there. We're gonna click on this bright star in this constellation. Its name is Aldebaran, all right? I'll say that one more time if you wanna try it for yourselves. Aldebaran, okay? Um, and the constellation it's in, here I'll connect the dots, you see that the V is right there and it comes up to these two points that way. Those points actually represent horns. You can see the front of a bull right there. And that bull's name happens to be Taurus, Taurus the bull, okay? Maybe some of you have actually ridden in one of those cards, the Ford Taurus, yeah. So, so Taurus means bull in this situation. And it looks like Orion's facing off against Taurus. So yeah, maybe Orion does need some help from some foxes or dogs or tigers, oh my, all right? Now, over at the back of the bowl, we see another great object that I would recommend you try to look at if you have some binoculars. So I'm gonna zoom in on that object here, um, a little bit farther back on the bowl. There we go. Now, I wanna get a good close look at this. So I'm gonna remove a lot of that stuff one more time here just to give you a good shot of this picture right here. That's exactly right, Ellie. You are looking at the Seven Sisters. Um, when you look at this with the naked eye, without any binoculars or telescopes, you probably see five, six, maybe even seven stars. I'm not gonna guarantee seven stars for you. Um, different cultures see different numbers of stars, but a, a few of them do say that there are seven there. Um, and when you look at this picture, obviously there's a lot more. In fact, this cluster contains about 1,500 stars. Um, you can call it the Seven Sisters. That's perfectly a fine name for it. Um, but another name for it is the Pleiades. Okay, that's what you're seeing right there now. So it's known as the Pleiades. Now you also see the name Subaru up there. I mentioned one car earlier, so now I guess I get to mention a car company. And the reason why is because the car company Subaru happened to name themselves after the Japanese name for this cluster, okay? Um, so they, if you ever look at the marquees of those cars, you will see that there are six stars on them. And they chose that because that was formed, that company was formed from the merger of five different companies to make the company Subaru, all right? So it's uh, really neat to see uh, that uh, other names of these clusters for different cultures. Um, so that's just one example right there. Um, if you're looking for other names of other uh, stars and so on from other cultures, uh, Stellarium actually has many great examples of this. And I wanna show that to you right now because I thought of it. Um, I showed you this earlier. You see this panel here that says Star Lore. If you click on that, you see many different cultures listed. 
Please understand that in the times before we had television or radio um, at night when there was no electric lighting and the skies were so much darker, people would sit around fires and tell each other stories. And they would use the stars in the sky to, an to anchor um, certain parts of those stories. It would help them remember uh, what roles certain characters played in those stories. And that applied to many civilizations all over the world. So all these different cultures have different names for different patterns in the sky. And if you go through this list right here, you can get a sense of what those, um, what those constellations would look like for those other cultures. Um, it's pretty fantastic to run through. I'm gonna stick with what we use here today in the US, which goes back to the Greek and Roman cultures, um, but it's still really great to uh, catch on to. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and continue zooming back out here. All right, um, so I told you that there was a planet we needed to hit, and it's right there between that V shape and Taurus's head, and the Seven Sisters. And it's right here, it's got kind of a reddish color. And maybe you're thinking which planet might look pretty reddish, all right? I'm gonna turn this off here and click on it. And let's go ahead and zoom in and see which planet's up tonight. If you're looking for this planet in your own night sky, you might have a hard time wondering which object up there is a planet and not a star. There's a couple ways you can do this. One is a slightly easier way and one requires some more dedicated viewing. Um, if you're looking at an object through a telescope, if you see it has a disc um, after you've got a nice resolved image, uh, that's going to tell you that you're looking at a planet because it's a lot closer to us. Stars are millions of times farther away um, their light, in fact, takes a few years to get to us from when it's emitted. Um, and so they're only going to be points of light. But since planets are a lot closer, you will actually see that circle of them. And here's the planet we're looking at right there. Ooh, look at that. All right. Well, you are seeing a red planet right now. And that red planet goes by the name of Mars right there. One thing I've actually recently learned on Stellarium uh, from doing these shows with you all is that there's actually some times where I can actually click on a couple of features on here. So there's apparently Elysium Fosse, um, and I can find random craters and so on um, by clicking on this. I have to admit to you folks, even though I'm doing this, I do not know what most of these features are. Um, one place you can actually try to explore what each of these features represent that I'm randomly clicking on is if you go to mars.google.com. I think they actually put up a map of Mars on that web page and you can go and see um, this, uh, all these parts of the surface themselves. Mars, however, is going to look very different on there because it's actually a topographic map. So the colors you'll see on there will not be all red. They're trying to show you differences of elevation. Um, just a really cool thing I wanted to share with you there. All right, let's go ahead and zoom back out. Okay. All right. So now, um, not seeing, uh, okay. Well, I think, one, let me show you one other thing and then I'm actually going to um, play around and show you some other things here tonight. Um, let's go ahead and you see that I'm looking towards the north, but I want to give you folks an easy, oh, you know what, I remembered that I'd forgotten some things I was going to tell you about Mars on how you can find Mars in your sky. I told you one way about how when you look at it through a telescope, you see that disk. There are two other ways that you can tell that Mars is a planet as opposed to a star. Uh, one of them is based off of twinkling. When it comes to the planets, Another thing that happens with them since they're so close to us is that they don't twinkle nearly as much as the stars. Since stars are point-like uh, uh, pieces of light in the sky uh, because of their great distance, they can be greatly affected by differences in our atmosphere. If parts of our atmosphere are a little warmer than others, parts of our atmosphere are a little bit more dense, maybe have a higher humidity, so there's more water vapor in the air at that point, uh, that light is gonna be slightly distorted. You'll see it flicker in brightness, 
um, or in colors a little bit. And that's what twinkling is all about. So twinkle, twinkle, little star folks is not just a nursery rhyme. There's actually some science to that concept. And with planets, since you actually can see a disk of them in the telescopes when there's, because they're so much closer, they don't twinkle nearly as much as the stars. So uh, if you see a bright object in the night sky and it's not twinkling as much as the stars are overhead, you're looking at a planet right there, okay? Another nice clue for it is if you actually know your stars well enough to know your constellations, um, here, I'm going to show you a line that's up here in the sky. This is a line that we call the ecliptic, and the ecliptic actually, I'll give away a lot of constellations right now. Um, let's see if I can do this. All right. There's a ton of them right there, and here I'll give you some names. Notice that the ecliptic happens to run through the constellations of Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and right there coming up above the horizon is Virgo. You might be familiar with those constellations. They're all constellations of the zodiac. And the reason why those constellations of the zodiac are grouped together as part of the zodiac is because this line, the ecliptic, is the path of the sun through the sky. And near that path, um, the moon follows along it, and so do the planets. So the planets also move through the zodiac constellations, and the moon does too. So if you find those planets, that can tell you you're probably looking at a, one, of, one of the zodiac constellations up there in the sky. All right, uh, just a cool thing to share. And of course, honestly, when I get to throw up all of this right here, it's just a really pretty view in Stellarium, getting those nice color artistic representations of the planets up there, okay? Now, I actually haven't mentioned the very last way that you can watch and see how um, Mars is definitely a planet. I'm showing you the date and time window now here at the bottom. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go up um, by what we call sidereal days. So this time period is about 23 hours and 56 minutes. It's a little bit less than one full day. It's the amount of time it takes for the stars to come back to the exact same point in the sky. It's entirely based off of Earth's rotation. It's the time Earth takes to, to make one complete rotation. Now, since that doesn't match the 24 hour day, that's because Earth is also orbiting around the sun at the same time. So watch this as I go up one sidereal day right here. You can check the time at the bottom to keep track of what I'm doing with this. Notice that you see the sky getting brighter there, okay? And here, I'm gonna take away the atmosphere. So yeah, that's the moon going past. So you're seeing Mars moving just a little bit up, basically towards the east with respect to the stars. You actually see the sun coming up now too, actually. All right, and we're actually at the end of April. So this is the way that we first understood planets were sticking out compared to the other stars. Thousands of years ago, astronomers would look up and see that the planets would move through the sky differently than the stars did. They moved compared to the stars. So the term planet actually comes from the word meaning wandering star, okay? Uh, so, so planets, had uh, set themselves apart in that fashion. But since those Greeks did not have uh, telescopes themselves, uh, it was impossible to understand the nature of these objects as being fundamentally different from stars. But that was the way that planets were first defined. Um, and because the moon and the sun also wander with respect to the stars, they were actually considered planets too in that fashion. Pretty wild to think about calling the sun a planet or the moon a planet, okay? Um, quite fun to think about there. All right, so those are all the different ways that you can tell that Mars would be a planet. Some of those take a few days to figure out. Some of those take a telescope, but others you can just look up and, uh, and you can figure it out with that way. And if you check those star charts, you can also get a hint from that too. All right, back to the point I was gonna show you. So we're looking towards the north right now, and I wanted to give you the easiest way that you can help yourself find north in the sky. Over here in the northeast, 
there's another extremely recognizable uh, group of stars right here. I'm not going to call it a constellation because it's part of a larger part of the sky than that. Um, but I'm going to draw some lines for you using my annotations. There we go. Look at that. Okay. There's some lines right there. Excellent. So what you see I've done is I have made kind of a dipper shape. All right. Um, maybe you see this as some sort of a cleaver or something. Maybe you see it as a shopping cart or a wagon. Um, all those names are perfectly fine. Um, I've heard frying pan for this thing too. But yeah, we're looking at what we usually call the Big Dipper right here. And the Big Dipper is noteworthy uh, because the Big Dipper helps us connect to a very important star. If you take the two stars farthest from the handle and draw a line with them up this way, you connect to that relatively bright star. It's actually not one of the top 10 or even top 20 or even top 40 brightest stars in the sky, but it's the brightest star in its part of the sky. So if you've got skies dark enough, you'll definitely be able to catch it. This object that we're talking about here, this star is named Polaris. And you might know it as the North Star. And the reason for that is because look at its position in the sky. It's directly above due north right there. And how long is it above due north? Well, let's watch this. We're going later into the night now. All right, Ooh, I'll do this instead. We're going later into the night right there. Now it's at about 9.12. Uh, it's a little bit earlier than what the current time is. I'll go later. They're getting to about 8 p.m. right there. And we see there are stars coming up in the eastern half of the sky. They're going down in the western half of the sky. And now it's a lot later, it's almost 11 p.m. But Polaris is staying in basically the same spot. So no matter where you're at in the northern hemisphere, once you can find Polaris, you can use that as a really useful tool for navigation. It will tell you exactly which way north is. Let me show you one other cool thing with Polaris that you can do here. All right, uh, I'm going to show you another line. Let me see if I've got the right button here. This is the meridian. It's a line that divides the eastern half of the sky from the western half. All right, and um, this line, if you watch and see exactly where Polaris is on this line, you measure its angle, you see here in Champagne, Polaris is at right at about 40 degrees. And the reason why that's the case is because Champagne has a latitude of about 40 degrees. If you're at the equator where your latitude is zero degrees, you would find Polaris way down at the horizon. If you actually go to the North Pole, you would have to look straight over your head up at the zenith at that point straight overhead at a 90 degree angle. That's where Polaris would be. And that's because at the North Pole, you're at a 90 degree latitude. And that makes sense because remember, Polaris is staying in that same spot in the sky because it is directly above Earth's North Pole. So as Earth spins round and round and round and round and round, well, the top of our planet is staying basically oriented in the same direction. So straight over our heads, that's where Polaris will continue to sit. So all throughout our entire lives, and what we've seen for hundreds of years, is Polaris basically locked in directly above our North Pole. And so it's been really good to help people find their way all around the world. Okay, yeah, it could be a spoon. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually change up some things here. Um, I told you how we don't have a whole lot of planets to look at in our evening sky. Um, if you'd like to see where the planets are coming up, I can go a lot later and share with you when they'll be rising. We're going to look over here in the east and see when they'll show up. There was actually an interesting convergence of a couple of planets coming up before dawn um, in our skies uh, just a few days ago, but I think it was cloudy that morning. Um, so these are the uh, planets that'll be coming up right before dawn. Uh, let's see here. I'll keep the uh, I'll keep the time up so you folks can watch it that way. So we're just after midnight now. Let's continue here. We're going to go till about four or five a.m. and let's see what we can find. 
Ah, I see Waylena's, her favorite star is coming up. I actually have to watch over here to find what's coming. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, the constellations that have just risen are a few of them that you would start to see. Uh, they'll look a lot better for you in the evening sky in the summertime. So you'll have to wait a few months to see these because it's obviously only March. Ooh, I accidentally went too far there. All right. So uh, here is the sky at about 518 a.m. And I do see our first culprits, the ones that we need to look for, are right here. Uh, so they're very, very low over in the east and southeast right there. Um, and I will click on the first one that came up. It'll be a bit tough to catch these because they're coming up just as the sky is starting to brighten right before dawn, but we can look at them right here. So let's click on this one and we'll zoom in on it. See what we have here. Uh, we got a lot of things around it. So it looks like this planet actually has a lot of moons surrounding it. Oh, I bet you folks know exactly which one this is right here. Okay, you can probably tell from the rings that we are looking at the planet Saturn, okay? So Saturn is probably the prettiest thing, uh, prettiest planet that you can look at through a telescope. Um, and it is undoubtedly because of that ring system. And that ring system changes from time to time because Saturn has a tilt just like Earth does. So you can see that ring system looking differently as it orbits around the sun. So it's a great thing to catch over the next several years uh, when you can look at it through a telescope. Um, and plus, when people see Saturn through a telescope, if they're looking at it for the first time, they usually think we're trying to pull the wool over your eyes, um, playing a trick on you, like we actually put a sticker on the telescope in some way. Um, but that is not the case. Saturn is just that pretty. So when you can get a chance to look at Saturn through a telescope, take that opportunity. It is a fantastic thing to observe. Okay, um, now we'll go and show you the next planet over here. It's actually a little bit brighter, even though it's lower. Um, and that's because it's a bigger planet and it's closer to us. And I don't like giving this stuff away. So let's click on it now and let's zoom in. Oh, this one has a couple of planets, but oh, interesting. There are actually only four of them we're seeing and they're in a straight line with each other. The reason why they're in a straight line, unlike what you saw with Saturn, is because this planet doesn't actually have an axial tilt like Earth or Saturn does. But when you look at it through a telescope, you get a pretty view of its cloud bands, what we call its belts and zones. And this view is actually giving us a shot of the great red spot right there. This is the largest planet in our solar system right here. It has more mass than all of the planet, other planets in the solar system combined, okay? So there's a lot of material there, all right? And this is the planet Jupiter, okay? So if you were looking for the king of all planets, that's the one. It's the largest one in our solar system. Um, yeah, uh, the reason for those cloud bands, well, Jupiter is made out of mostly gas, and so those are actually clouds and they go deep down and there's more and more gas underneath that. That's right. So that great red spot, I've got my cursor on right now. That's actually a tremendously large storm system. To give you a sense of how large it is, that storm system is bigger than Earth. Yeah, we're talking about a storm that's larger than our entire planet right there. Oh, just amazing to think about. Um, the cloud bands, uh, the reason for the different colors is because, well, actually, in some ways, astronomers are not actually certain yet. The whites we see there, we understand that that's mainly because of ammonia. But when you have those reds and browns and other colors you get from Jupiter, um, astronomers aren't certain what chemicals are contributing to that. Um, and the uh, actual fact that the clouds are forming these very nice stripe patterns right there, that's just because the wind speeds on Jupiter are so strong. And Jupiter spins really fast compared to Earth does, compared to Earth. OK, um, so that contributes to why we see those bands around Jupiter right there. OK, so those are those planets. And if you're looking for two other planets that would be visible to us, um, I'm going to go ahead and cheat and I'm going to take away the ground. I know this is a big faux pas, but hopefully you're going to just allow it for this time. Um, 
So let's see here. We've got a really bright point of light right next to the sun. That makes me guess that this is Venus over here and this is Mercury. Let's click on this one and find out if it's Mercury. Yep, there's Mercury right there. A couple of days ago, uh, the moon was actually right next to Jupiter, Saturn, and Mercury. Um, but you can see right below the sun, the moon is actually new at this moment. So uh, the moon is starting a new lunar cycle. So in a few days, we'll start to see crescent moons coming up right after sunset over in the west. So keep an eye out for that if you've got a clear night that night. All right. Um, and there's Venus right there. But I'll show you what I was talking about with the moon. Here's what it looked like two days ago. Where's our moon? Oh, there it is. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Um, two days ago. So Ah, it looks like I have to go three days ago. There we go. So the morning of March 10th, look at that. You had this nice little foursome right there. The moon was right next to where the um, those three planets were sitting. That would have been a nice grouping to take a photograph of that day. Sorry, I'm telling you about this afterwards. Okay, but that's just the way it goes sometimes. All right. So um, what I'll do now is I'll actually give you folks a chance to see a nice sunrise um, for tomorrow here. Oops, did it wrong. There we go. All right, uh, that's today again, and there's tomorrow morning right there. Uh, Jupiter is the king, Saturn's the queen, and Neptune and Uranus are the prince and princess. Oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. Okay, um, let me turn these off here, and I will zoom back out a little bit. We're looking back towards the east and we're going to just watch the sun come up. Okay, oh, look at that. Yep, there's the sun and there's the moon right next to it. Okay, so yeah, you're not going to see the moon that day because the part of the moon that's lit up by the sun is facing directly away from Earth. Okay, so that's uh, going to prevent us from seeing any sorts of, uh, you know, pretty crescents or anything from the moon. But just wait a couple of days, you'll be able to catch it then. All right. Now, I had a couple of other things that I was going to share with you folks. Um, and since you've been up all night with me so far, I mean, look, you just saw a sunrise. Um, I think you won't mind uh, me sharing a few more things with you. Let me go to this first. Now, uh, I think you folks are aware that St. Patrick's Day is coming up uh, in a few days. And unfortunately, for those of you who are always looking for holiday themed nebulae or objects that you can find in your night sky, um, you're not going to find any nebulae that are shamrocky or clovery or or green beery <laughs> um, like that. Um, but I can show you some cool green things in the night sky. And for those, you don't have to go into deep space necessarily to catch them, all right? There's some stuff that's actually just hanging above Earth. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and share um, my, uh, my web browser with you right now. Okay. Uh, remember how I was telling you about that Google Mars? This is what the Google Mars looks like. Uh, the reds right there are showing you extremely high elevations and the blues are showing you extremely low elevations. So as I said, it's just a beautiful thing to look at. If you wanted to see what it looks like in visible light, they end up giving you this nice monochrome image right there. Okay. And then infrared shows you that as well. Um, so I'll leave it to you folks to explore that one on your own. So here's the uh, stellar, there's the calendar right there for the planetarium. And um, I wanted to show you another couple of other nice websites as well to catch here. Um, this one, spaceweather.com is a wonderful site that updates every day. Um, if you've been hoping to see sunspots in your skies, um, there's not going to be many that you can catch right now because there's only two on the sun and they're not very big. So they're not terribly worth looking for at this time. But this site also shows you how the aurora looks like over our northern hemisphere. And look at that. It looks like it's pretty expansive. So parts of Canada and Scandinavia should be able to see, in Greenland and Iceland, of course, should be able to see some nice aurorae. Uh, tonight. Um, and that would be a cool thing to catch if you were in those parts of the world. There are other ways you can view this if you want to see how it looks over New Zealand. 
Look at that right there. Looks like it's going to be mainly focused over Antarctica at this moment, uh, something we really can't catch um, in uh, those parts of the world at this time. Um, but when that aurora does show up really nicely, there have been some amazing photographs taken from this. And actually one of my favorite shows that the planetarium has to offer is called Experience the Aurora. Um, and they show you a number of these full dome videos where you can see this from Norway. Um, but I'll just show you a couple of pictures that I grabbed from astronomy picture of the day. Like I said, you're gonna see a lot of green coming up just in celebration of St. Patty's Day. So here's one that's just a really amazing photograph. This person caught an aurora that, if you use your eyes and use your imagination, probably looks a lot like an eagle, okay? So you're seeing an eagle right there. I think that's, I think that's a pretty legitimate, um, you know, thing to compare that to. You kind of even see eagles' wings off of that. This was on Astronomy Picture of the Day a little while back. Um, apparently, the guy's name is Bjorn Jorgensen, um, and... I apologize for not knowing the proper Norwegian pronunciation right there. Um, but nevertheless, you are seeing uh, that happening there. Um, and they always have lots of great links to follow there at the bottom. Um, let's see here. I see something in the chat as well. Oh, maybe I don't. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah, you could definitely see it like some sort of saber-toothed tiger. I could see a Smilodon from that. Yeah, why not? Yeah, like I said, it's like what you see when you look at clouds. Use your imagination. Um, if you see that in the star patterns, all of those are going to be fine. So there's a really nice one. I'm going to share the links that I found here with you folks in a few minutes as well. All right. So here's our next one. This one was over Iceland, if memory serves. Um, and this person found this neat spiral shape with the aurora right there. That is really nice. Um, it kind of reminds me of that plant known as the monkey monkey's tail. Um, that's what I'm seeing right there. That's yeah. And it's, I think we might have the moon up at this moment that they were able to catch this. So feel free to read up on that. Like I said, I'll get those links up. Here's our next one. Oh, wow. So here's where you start to really see the Aurora looking like curtains up in the sky. And that person, I cannot believe somebody standing right up there. That looks really dangerous for them to stand there. And this one's also in Norway right here. And they took this photograph back in 2014. All right, let me go ahead and before I show the next one, I'm gonna actually give you the links to all of these aurorae that I was uh, bringing up here, okay? Oh yeah, I could see a snail. Thanks, thanks, Nix. All right, um, oh yes, here we go. There's those five links. I'm almost done here. Um, this one is actually not an aurora, I admit, but this is a neat atmospheric phenomenon that always intrigues me. And I haven't seen this yet for myself, but I really want to try this. In order to see something like this happen, you need to be basically looking over the ocean when one of these objects is rising. Um, you'll be able to get a wild atmospheric phenomenon where the way that the light refracts through the atmosphere at that extremely low altitude, sometimes the light refracts in such a way that you can catch what they call a green flash. And that's what this photograph is showing you of the sun. Somebody also caught it for the moon as it was rising. Here you can actually see a little bit of a green flash on Venus and somebody actually even caught it on Ver Mercury. Really amazing. Okay, um, so that one, it involves these astronomical objects, but it's more of an atmospheric phenomenon, but it's really neat to catch there too. Okay, uh, here's one more amazing Aurora photo. And this is one from truly rarefied air right here because it's taken from above the Aurora. This one is actually photographed from the International Space Station. And this reminds me of one of my favorite videos that I've ever seen. I'm not gonna play this one right now. I'm gonna just give you folks the link in the chat so you can watch this, all right? Um, it is a truly amazing video and I love the music for it, um, but I don't want you to have to watch this through a stream. I will just let you go and find this on your own. Here, you can at least see what the page looks like from my end when it loads up right here. It's apparently called Earth by Michael Koenig. Um, and, he, and he was able to uh, share this video of um, various clips 
of Aurora uh, from looking at the uh, from the International Space Station. It's just fantastic. Okay, so that's that's another really great one. All right, um, I already showed that one too. Um, and if you ever have moments where the auroral oval actually gr dramatically expands and you get a much greater aurora, you want to check spaceweather.com to find out um, when those nights might be a time for you to step outside and then look for the aurora borealis. Okay. All right. Um, one other cool website I wanted to share with you all right here. Um, I wanted to bring up Heavens Above. Heavens Above is a cool website if you're looking to see when satellites are going to pass overhead. Uh, you'll notice that at the time that this clip came up, uh, you see that the International Space Station is actually flying over Europe at that time. I'm going to hit refresh on this because I don't think it's there anymore. Yeah, the, now the ISS is actually moving right over the southern portion of the Pacific Ocean right there. Um, you're not going to be able to see the ISS tonight, at least this evening. I think it's cloudy out there, so you're not going to catch it anyways. But if you click on here, you can see when the ISS is scheduled to pass overhead um, at various times over the next few days. So apparently the ISS will be able to see it tomorrow morning at about 4.18 a.m. And it's gonna be pretty bright. Minus 2.7 magnitude, that's brighter than even the star Sirius. It'll probably even be brighter than the, the, the planet Mars. So um, that is gonna be quite bright, easy to catch uh, tomorrow morning. And if you don't wanna wake up at that hour, I totally understand. Notice that coming up in a few evenings, it'll start to show up after sunset as well. So look here. On St. Patrick's Day at 8.23, the ISS is going to start to come up then as well. You click on this link and they actually give you a nice star chart showing the way that the ISS is going to pass overhead. And for that evening at that time, it's going to go right underneath Orion, just past Sirius and right over to Leo. And it stops abruptly right here because it falls behind Earth's shadow. The only reason we can see the ISS is when it's actually reflecting sunlight back down to Earth. And once it falls in Earth's shadow, well, there's no sunlight for it to reflect at that time. Okay, so yeah, that's a really cool way to check that out. All right, um, let's see here. I think those are all the websites I wanted to share with you right there. Um, so, uh, oh, look at that. Waylena's right there. I don't know why she wasn't listed as a panelist. I'm sorry about that, Waylena. I just noticed you pop on. Um, so, hi, Waylena. <laughs> um, maybe you'll be able to talk now. Um, or maybe you just wanted to uh, just at least watch my show. All right. So, folks, um, that's everything I wanted to share with you this evening. Um, do you have any requests or any questions? You could uh, use the Q&A, you could use the chat, you could raise your hand if you really prefer asking your question um, by speaking into the microphone. How young are the Seven Sisters? That's a great question, Ellie. The Seven Sisters are not nearly as young as those stars that you saw in the Orion Nebula. The Seven Sisters are actually about 100 million years old. And that sounds really old, and it is, but it's not that old compared to a star like the sun, which is almost 5 billion years old, okay? Um, and the, that cluster is still so young that the stars are actually still clustered together. The stars haven't dispersed themselves through the galaxy. Uh, the picture I shared with you of the Pleiades, let me see if I can bring that up in Stellarium. And I'll show you that picture one more time here. Let me see if I can do this. And I'm going to go share my screen right now. Look closely at this image. Do you see all that blue gas that's surrounding the Seven Sisters? Well, that's the gas that actually helped form those stars in that cluster. Okay, and usually the first thing that you see disappear from a cluster is the gas. And you see in this situation, that gas hasn't been quite blown away by that starlight or those stellar winds from those hot, bright, and still very young stars. Okay, so that open cluster is still pretty young, but I wouldn't say that it's a, you know, a nebula where they're forming right there. Okay. Oh, 
that's too bad. All right. Okay, I'll stop sharing there. How many stars are in Leo? That's a really tough question to ask, I have to tell you. Um, it depends on how you want to define that. But let me go ahead and show you a couple of ways that you could um, present that question right there. Let's see what I can do. I'm gonna go to the constellation Leo, just like you asked. I'm gonna actually cough for a second. Nobody needs to hear that cough on the recording. So that's why I did that. <laughs> All right. Oh, I went to a dwarf galaxy in Leo. Let's see what I can do here. All right. Excuse me. Um, don't need to be doing that. All right. So I'm all disoriented right now. There it is. Okay. I'm going to do this just because it makes more sense in my mind to see it this way. So if you're talking about defining the stars that apparently that person drew those lines, the most common way people draw the lines of the constellation we are right there, what you're seeing. And notice that when you connect the dots in this way, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine stars. That said though, few of these stars seem to be doubles in a way. Like notice that this star right here, Algeba, has a double right there, an optical double, okay? Um, but you could draw this constellation in a different way. The, uh, one of the co-creators of Curious George, AHA Ray, had actually decided that they wanted to draw this constellation in a different fashion. Let's take a look at this now. Oh my goodness, that looks a lot more like a lion. And what H.A. Ray did was they actually did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 stars to make up that lion. Okay, and you can see all sorts of other ways that they wanted to uh, light up the sky in that fashion. That said, though, here's the last way I'm going to answer this question. You could go ahead and potentially count up every single star inside of this boundary, and you could say those are all the stars in Leo. Now, the reason why that this is kind of an arbitrary choice is remember, this is going to be limited, not just based on what you can see with your own eyes or what you could see through binoculars, or what you could see through any telescope, or the most powerful telescopes in the world. There might be some stars that are just too dim. They're in that direction, but not even those powerful telescopes can catch them. And when you catch some of these stars, notice that when I do this, here's Denebola. Apparently it's only about 36 light years away, which means that that light has been traveling to us since 1985 and it finally got here. But then you've got this star over here that's 58 light years away. And this one, 125. Regulus is about 80, okay? All these stars are at different distances. So even though we see them in the same part of the sky, we are not looking at stars that are actually in each other's neighborhood. Okay, they just happen to be in the same direction. They're not actually clustered the way the stars in the Great Orion Nebula are or the way the stars of the Pleiades are. They just happen to be in the same direction we're looking. Some of them could be a lot farther from the others. And so those other stars we see up there could be actually a lot closer to us than they are to those other stars in Leo. All right, there was another great question up here and I didn't get a chance to read it. So I'm gonna do that right now. Ah, so Jasper at age seven asked if there are any stars without planets. Um, yes, I would say that there are, okay? Let me see uh, the way that I can answer that question for you, Jasper. Um, so at this time, there are a number of ways that we use, that astronomers use to find planets around other stars. Usually it has to be a very indirect method. We have to look and see how that planet is affecting the star's light. Maybe it's making the star move towards us and away from us. 
um, and so that it makes its light uh, shift via the Doppler effect. Or sometimes the planet might pass in front of the star and block a tiny amount of the light. And we would see that happen that way. Or it's making the star wobble in such a way that we can actually measure that motion. Um, and the number of stars that we've been able to, the number of stars where we've seen planets around them, uh, let me see if I can get this displayed for you right here. Here it is. All right. So this button right here, show exoplanets. I'm going to click on this. This shows you every star in the sky that has a confirmed exoplanet orbiting around it. Notice that that's not every single um, star. And then you see a ton of them right here in this part of the sky. And that's because there was a mission that was looking at that part of the sky constantly for a couple of years. It was called the Kepler mission. And they found thousands of exoplanets orbiting stars over there. Based off of our current estimates, it's expected that for every star in the galaxy, there's on average at least one planet orbiting um, that in our galaxy as well. Now, since there are actually galaxies, um, since there are actually, um, wow, I'm sorry, I'm misspeaking. I've got my uh, head getting mixed up here. Since there are actually um, stars that have multiple planets, that's telling you why it's an average, because there's definitely going to be stars out there that have no planets orbiting around them. But since it's so hard to detect actual planets orbiting other stars, uh, we can't say for certain exactly how many. Um, so, so it's tough to say. All I can tell you is that our galaxy has over 100 billion stars, and also it likely has over 100 billion planets. But we've only confirmed about 4,000 of them so far. Okay, let's see here. Ellie asks, how and how long does it take sunlight to get to Earth? This, here, I'll give you a math problem. I'm kidding. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to tell you the answer. Um, the sun is roughly about 150 million kilometers away from Earth. Um, that's about 93 million miles. Okay, and I don't think your car is driven that long. Um, but even though light can travel over 186,000 miles every second, or about 300 million kilometers every second, it takes light about eight minutes to travel from the sun to earth. So whenever you look and see the sunlight outside on a nice sunny day, that's light left the sun eight minutes ago. Okay. Um, yeah, pretty wild to think about. And the farther you get from the sun, the longer it takes that light to reach you. So for Mars, since Mars is about 50% farther from the sun, that light takes about 12 minutes to get to Mars from the sun, okay? Um, for Jupiter, I showed you Jupiter tonight. Jupiter receives sunlight from about 40 minutes ago, okay? So yeah, pretty neat. Let's see here, Nick says, do we know if the various solar systems are more likely to have terrestrial or Jovian planets? Wow, Nick, that's a great question. Um, and based off of the number of planets we've found so far, um, it seems that I'm going to have to, you know what, I don't want to confidently say this off the top of my head. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and bring up a slide that I share in my lectures. I can't believe I'm doing this. Waylene is just laughing at me for like, oh, he's bringing up his lecture slides again. Um, you're awesome. Oh my gosh. All right. That's okay. That's okay. I, I saw you were having those issues. That's all right. But I'm glad you could join us here. All right. Thanks for your patience, folks. I'm bringing it up. Um, but talk amongst yourselves. His lecture slides seriously have been incredibly useful. And um, so I, don't get, you know, don't get all like, oh my God, he's showing lecture slides, ah. <laughs> all right, there won't be a quiz at the end. I didn't write any polls, I promised that too. All right, so here we go. Um, this is the lectures, two of the lecture slides I wanted to show you. So uh, a few years back, this lecture slide here, um, 
I actually am not showing where I got this source from, and that makes me feel really guilty. It's probably actually from the textbook we're currently using for the class. That's probably why I don't have an attribution. Um, so this is showing you all of the planets that had been discovered at the time this graphic was made. And you're getting a good size comparison for each of them. You're seeing how many, um, what fraction of them it has are about the size of Jupiter, what fraction are about the size of Saturn, and so on. Um, and we're saying that we would expect that among what has been seen, what they would be like. What And so apparently a very large number of them are actually not the size of our Jovian planets and not the size of the terrestrial planets we see in the solar system. A lot of them would be like super Earths or mini Neptunes, okay? So they would probably actually be more likely terrestrial, all right? However, when you get that large, they're probably gonna have a lot more water than Earth does. And so there might not be any exposed land masses on the surface of that planet. So you'd actually have water worlds in that situation. Now, this diagram is an estimate. It's showing you what, based off of um, our observational biases, as in, since it's so hard to detect those smaller planets, they expect that there's gonna be a lot more of them actually out there than what we can see through our current instruments. And this is showing you that planets the size of Earth would take up a much larger fraction. And notice that this diagram is telling you the average number of planets per star. So they're saying that for your average star, they'll have about a third of them with an Earth-sized planet. And also roughly about a third of them would have some super Earths, okay? So that's a pretty wild thing to consider. And you see that the numbers do go down dramatically when you get down to about the size of Jupiter, but a fair number of them might have some Neptune-sized planets. So that's pretty cool to think about. All right, what was Ellie's question? Why do star drawings look different than real stars? One of my favorite questions. Would you mind answering it? Well, to me, the reason that star drawings, it's the same with like drawings of the sun. We, um, we put little spikies coming out of them and it, it's a way in, in drawings to show that they're shining, they're, they're, they're making their own light. Now with stars, the, there's the additional factor of when we see them in the sky, I mean, usually we see them twinkling unless the air is very, very steady. And if you're making a drawing, uh, not an animation, but just a drawing, you're not making it sparkle, but you can make it, you know, you can make it look like it's twinkling and, and, and so it, it just comes down to light and representing yeah. things that are that are shining and sparkling when you're just making it into a drawing. So I love drawings wow. of stars and the sun, even though they don't look anything like the real thing. And I love the real thing too. Yeah, I can really appreciate that artistic flourish to it. I mean, people, as I said, people have been see, able to see twinkling of the stars for thousands of years. And that's gonna look a lot better in a piece of artwork than just, here's a dot, here's a dot. <laughs> Cause it's not really a dot. Remember it's a point of light, right? Um, and, then, and then you have to wonder how astigmatism makes the stars look pretty too. <laughs> if you have bad eyesight, the stars can get prettier sometimes. <laughs> All right. Are there a few things in the sky that are only in March? Um, it kind of depends. Um, when it comes, you, you saw how uh, Jupiter and Saturn were both coming up right before dawn and they had actually come up after some constellations that I usually find easiest to observe in the summer. And that was Scorpius and Sagittarius. And it's just because they're so low in the South if you're wanting to see them in the evening, there's only a limited time of the year you can catch them. If they're closer up, closer to Polaris up by the North Star, you're gonna see them all throughout the year. So those stars that are farther south are gonna have a little bit more of a limited window. 
Um, but there's still going to be various times of the night at a lot more times of the year that you can see them. Okay, so if you're looking for an actual proper answer to the question as opposed to describing why that is the case, um, I don't know for certain, but I can at least give you a guess. All right, so we're going back to Stellarium and we're going to play this game. The sun's up and and I don't think that this is gonna be the right answer to say with this, but I'm just gonna do it anyways. So let's go ahead and imagine what's coming up tonight. Okay, so here's the sky tomorrow night. All this stuff really, really low in the sky down here are objects that we have a very difficult time seeing. So in the evening sky tonight, a star like this one, whose name is actually not even there because it's not that bright uh, is coming up. Um, but all of these things, you see what such a limited window we have to look at those objects that are really far south, okay? Um, here, I'll pause this. I'm just gonna go up by hours now. But you see those things come up very quickly and, and it's really tough to catch. So you see how tough Scorpius is honestly to catch around here. Um, and if you go farther south than that, because of where Champagne's at, you'll see a lot of objects down by where the south celestial pole is that you just can't see around Champagne at all. Things like the Southern Cross, here's Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to our solar system. Um, it's actually a star system, there's three stars there. Um, here's Beta Centauri, uh, we got our False Cross over here. Okay, uh, Canopus should be right below Sirius. Yep, that's Canopus right there. All right, um, so all sorts of stuff that because of how far north we are, we can actually never see those objects. It's just that in March, sure, there might be something that's limited to be seen like only in the early evening, um, but it's gonna be at a different time of the night at other times of the year. It's not gonna be limited ever for a single month of the year. So there's no March star like there's a March hair. Ooh, bad, bad, bad attempt at a pun. I don't care. Folks, do you have any other questions for us? Is there a purple sun? That's a cool question. Oh my gosh, yes. So when you've seen a couple of stars there, uh, some of some certain colors. You saw some reds. Maybe you saw one that looked kind of orange. You certainly saw some whites. Maybe you've heard that if you take sunlight and pass it through a prism or, or um, you know, or other certain pieces of glass, you might be able to break it up into a rainbow. And our rainbow has the whole Roy G. Biv of color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, I guess indigo, sure, why not? And violet, okay? And I'm glad cosmic colors skip that indigo thing. They just pop that right out of there. <laughs> um, but, so Reggie Buff is there. And the cold stars, most of their light, <laughs> cold stars, most of their light they're gonna give off is in the visible spectrum is gonna be red. And then when you get hotter, you can give off a little bit more orange light. And so they might start to look orange. And when they get hotter, they can start to give off some yellow light as well. But once you get hotter than that, they're gonna be give, able, to, able to give off light across the entire visible spectrum. And when you add up all those colors of the rainbow, then you get white. So for that reason, not only are there no purple stars really, there's really no green stars either, okay? The reason we get some blue stars is they give off all that light, but they give off so much more blue light, you get a nice blue tinge to them. But there's one last problem with all of this. Our eyes are not very well attuned to looking at violet light. So when we talk about certain Doppler effects like red shift, we usually don't say violet or purple shift, we say blue shift. And this also shows up in the way that you look up at the sky during the day on a sunny day. That sky looks blue. It doesn't look violet because our eyes are not very well attuned to seeing that violet light very well. It's just the way that our eyes are working. 
is there any gaps that you wanted to fill in with my explanation there, Waylena? I, I feel like I might have missed one critical component with what I was saying, because I did even talk about why the sky was blue. <laughs> I, I'm searching for a picture to, to, to share that you made me think of, but it's hmm. not super important. So I don't know if I have it on this computer. I'm not on my on my usual computer. Ah, OK. That's all right. Um, Rachel makes a lovely observation. I love seeing twilight sky colors as well. Having that sun pass through, having that sunlight pass through so much of the atmosphere that you only get really the reds, oranges, and yellows gives you such pretty colors. And of course, pre-dawn and, and, and post-sunset can look quite pretty as well. Um, and if it passes through a couple of clouds, oh, you can get such great colors that way too. Okay. Yeah, it is like that, Ellie. It does actually work backwards in that way. Red has less energy of light than violet does. So blue is actually a hotter color of light. It's more energetic color of light than red is. So those blue stars I was showing you are a lot hotter than the red stars I was showing you. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Use that emoji. <laughs> Okay. For those of you watching this later on on YouTube, uh, she put the semicolon in the O. <laughs> All right. If there was a life on a planet with a blue star, how do you think life might evolve differently? Well, I don't know what to say about how they might uh, evolve with eyes in order to receive and process light. Um, but I do know that there's a couple of major problems of having life around a blue star. Stars that happen to be blue happen to have a lot more mass than the sun does. And since they're also a much hotter star giving off that blue light, that means they're giving off a lot more ultraviolet light. And they might be giving off some more x-rays as well. And so you know how bad ultraviolet can be for us here on the ground. We have our ozone layer to protect us. Well, if it's giving off that much more ultraviolet light, ooh, that might prevent life from evolving there entirely, okay? And then one other major problem is that stars that have more mass, they actually have shorter lifetimes because they burn through their fuel. They, they consume the hydrogen in their cores much more quickly. So they have much shorter lifetimes. So a blue star, like those that you saw in the Pleiades or whatever, they might only live for less than a billion years. And look at how long it took for life like humans to show up on earth, okay? So it might not be enough time for life to get to the point of a civilization. So that's one major concern. Usually when people are looking for signs of life around other stars, they're usually looking for sunlight stars for that reason. Great questions tonight, folks. Do you have any others for us? Oh, how are cool stars hotter than hot stars? Well, they're, okay, they're so cool, right? But they're, we gotta call them blue stars. Okay, so the reason why the, the blue stars are hotter is just because those blue stars, um, with their greater amount of mass, their cores are much more densely packed. And so since their cores are more densely packed, they can fuse hydrogen into helium far more efficiently. So they can release a lot more energy from their cores than a star like the sun. And when that energy comes up to the surface, it heats up that surface to much higher temperatures. Temperatures that could be like twice the sun's surface temperature. The sun's surface temperature is about 6,000 kelvins or about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, for those stars that are blue, they're going to be at least 12,000 kelvins or getting up to about 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And so since they're giving off all that much more light, you can see how they would give off that energy so much more quickly. Okay. And like I said, since they're hotter, they're going to be able to give off light of higher energies. And that's where the blue is coming from. How many planets are in the whole place? Wait, Lena, how would you define the whole place? The whole place? All of it. All of it? Sure, all of it. I gave one definition. I said that 
it, our galaxy has at least 100 billion planets. So in our- How many galaxies? How many galaxies? Well, what? So I usually still say 100 billion galaxies, but I know the right answer is over a trillion. But even then, you take roughly 100 billion and you multiply by 100 billion. And in the visible universe, if there is one star, one planet for every star out there, we have 60 sextillion planets. Okay. I'm going to write that number into the chat just to make you all be in pain. Here we go. I'm up to 60 billion. There's 60 trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion. There you go. Six times 10 to the 22nd. Yes. That's how she responded. Okay. That is, for those of you who know a little bit of chemistry, that's about one tenth of Avogadro's number right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody's mind is blown. Everybody on the planet Earth, their mind has been blown. Yeah, I know. That's right. Yeah, Jeremy, the first planet found outside of our solar system was only found in 1995. And now we know of the existence of over 4,000 of them. And based off of how we understand how many planets there are in our galaxy, most likely, we can estimate how many planets are probably out there in the universe. And of course, you know, maybe my estimate's actually completely wrong because I'm only talking about what we know in our galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. It's very improper of me to draw those same assumptions to galaxies that are shaped like ellipses or um, galaxies that are elliptical <laughs> um, or that there are galaxies that are shaped like um, very irregularly shaped too. Okay. What was the first galaxy that we found? Um, that depends on how, what you want to say with that. The first time we were certain that these objects were actually a different galaxy was based off of evidence people like Edwin Hubble found a hundred years ago when they were looking at the Andromeda galaxy. Okay. Island universes. Yes, the island universes. That's right. And then they had to make up a term to explain what we were looking at when we were looking at these objects. And so inspiration for that term came from the word for Milky Way in other languages. The word for Milky Way in Latin is Via Lactea, which guess what it means? Milky Way, okay? It means Milky Way. And the Greek word that translates also to Milky Way is Galaxias Kiklos, okay? Notice the word I said there, Galaxias. Galaxy basically means Milky, <laughs> okay? Um, that's where it got applied. So the Milky Way is essentially the prototype of all of our, these other galaxies, yeah. Are the stars formed differently in spiral versus elliptical galaxies? Oh my gosh. We're just going to do this, my whole astronomy class tonight, aren't we? <laughs> this is awesome. I, I'm, I'm going to have to step away for just a moment, although you'll get, to see, you'll get to see the space cat shirt. It's a laser. Space laser eye cat. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So um, with elliptical galaxies, one thing that we notice about them is that they don't seem to have a whole lot of gas or dust inside of them. And gas and dust is essential for being able to form stars. So these elliptical galaxies, for the most part, are not forming many stars. So the stars in them are very, very old because they formed billions of years ago, okay? So star formation is really not happening inside of elliptical galaxies. They went through a flurry of star formation a long time ago, and it's basically stopped. Um, what people have found around a lot of those big elliptical galaxies is they'll find there's lots of gas in between the galaxies because that flurry of star formation seems to have actually expelled, ejected that gas out of those galaxies and it's still very, very hot. So to answer your question, for elliptical galaxies nowadays, they're not really forming any stars. Oh, wow. Um, How about the Hyades? Hyades is another good example. They're half cousins. 
yeah. the Pleiades, right? Yeah. You remember that V-shape in Taurus I showed you? Every star there, except for Aldebaran, is part of a cluster of stars called the Hyades. That's another cool cluster of stars. There are lots of neat clusters you can find in the night sky, and quite a few of them you can see with your own eyes. The Pleiades you can see with your eyes, the Hyades, like I just said. There's a cool cluster in the constellation Cancer between Regulus in Leo and Pollux in Gemini. If you draw a line between them, you'll find the Beehive Cluster. Okay, and then there's another one in Perseus called the double cluster that's really pretty and great to see through a telescope or binoculars. Um, but the only brothers that I know in the night sky are really the two brothers of Gemini. <laughs> um, but that's not a cluster like we were seeing with the Pleiades. Um, are, the, are the Hyades also sisters or is it just a name? Um, I, I, I think I they know. are sisters as okay. well, um, okay. like half cousins of the Pleiades sisters. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know that. And, and um, cool. you recall in some uh, uh, cultures, the Pleiades were the seven brothers. Oh, ah, okay, neat. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were others out there that were siblings. Just in, have to find different cultures. Stories, yeah. Nice, good to know. Very cool. I mean, you got, you know, like the Gemini twins, of course. Excellent. Castor and Pollux, they're siblings. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. All right. Other questions, folks? Do stars have twins? I would say absolutely. Um, we uh, Astronomers have found that many of the stars you see in the night sky, not only do they seem to have optical, a lot of them have optical doubles where you'll see another star nearby, but they have found many instances where there are actually two stars orbiting each other, or sometimes even more than two stars, okay? Those are systems that they refer to as binary systems. Okay. Um, isn't Castor actually a binary system? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, one that you can actually see with your own eyes. And this one, people are not certain that they actually orbit each other. If you look up at the Big Dipper and you look up at the middle star in the handle, this one's going to be an eye test. See if you can see a slightly dimmer star right above that star. Those are Mizar and Alcor right there. And People have looked very closely at the distances to those two stars, and they found they're only roughly three or four light years apart from each other, okay? So they might not be orbiting each other, but when they look closely at Mizar, they found out that Mizar actually is a binary. And not just a binary, Mizar has four stars orbiting each other. Two binaries orbiting each other. It's actually a double binary in that way. Okay, a double double or whatever you want to call it. Okay, that sounds like a Wendy's burger or something. <laughs> um, or is that actually steak and shake? I don't remember. <laughs> it's been a while since I've had fast food. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are four stars there. They can see two stars in Mizar, and then they looked at the light from those two stars, and they found out there was actually two more stars. Okay. Um, yeah, so there are definitely stars with twins. And it seems like half of the stars in the night sky are actually binary systems of that type. Um, the way Rachel uh, or Jasper might have asked this question, uh, the way that the moon might look and behave differently is that when you're on the opposite side of Earth, the moon is going to look like it's upside down compared to what you normally see. Um, it will still rise in the east and set in the west, but you'll see it moving towards the northern part of the sky as it gets higher up, rather than it moving up towards the southern part of the sky. And the first time you're ever in the southern hemisphere after spending your entire life in the northern hemisphere, no matter who you are, that's going to be extremely disorienting. I went to Brazil seven years ago, and I was only, I started off that trip only about five degrees south of the equator. And I was already completely disoriented with my night sky. <laughs> it was it was tough going. And remember, I didn't have a north star to look at because I was south of the equator. But I did know where to find the South Celestial Pole because I found my Southern Cross. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, we have sent a spacecraft past Pluto a few years back, the New Horizons spacecraft. It's the big reason why we have such close up, beautiful pictures of that world, okay? It's why we now know that Pluto is far more geologically active than other worlds that we've looked at, including our moon, okay? Um, because we see very few craters on Pluto, all right? Um, we could conceivably land on Pluto. It would take a long time, and we'd have to have a lot more money in the space program to send another thing there. But yeah, it's possible. I think that we can do it. We just, you know, need the cash. Yeah. Do we know if there are tardigrades on other planets? Well, Nix, I have to tell you, if we find life of any kind on another planet, that is going to not just blow up the internet, that is going to blow up the news cycle all over the world. Because the first confirmation of life outside of Earth would be that case. And if there's any animal from Earth that's going to survive the trip to another planet, it's definitely going to be a tardigrade. So you got that right. How many more dwarf planets are there? Right now, the official list is four others. There's one in the asteroid belt called Ceres. It was discovered back in 1801, on New Year's Day, actually. Um, then there are three other objects that were discovered earlier in this century, in fact. Okay. Um, their names are Eris, Haumea, and Make Make. Okay. Um, if you see its name, don't pronounce it Make Make. It's Make Make. All right. Um, make Make. <laughs> it's too easy to say. It's fun. Um, but those are the five that are confirmed. There are a few others that I would say need to be on the list, including Gong Gong, definitely. That's the one that used to be called Snow White. Um, and and um, they just have not been uh, promoted or, uh, re -design or designated as such yet. Um, but there's an astronomer out there named Mike Brown who actually keeps a list based off of what we understand to be the size of those objects and what he thinks definitely or likely or could be considered a dwarf planet. And his list runs into the hundreds. So it's pretty cool like that, yeah. Um, for all these objects, um, all of them are too dim to see with the naked eye. Ceres is pretty close to us. It would be the easiest one to catch through a telescope, um, but the others are very dim objects out in the Kuiper belt or beyond and you need some pretty powerful telescopes to see them. That's why they were only discovered after the year 2000. Okay, it's very tough to catch them. Can I show them to you? So demanding, let's see what I can do. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, hey, I still have this up. Um, I'm closing one piece of software that I didn't get to tonight. Um, I think I promised in my Facebook Live that I was going to show NASA's eyes and I didn't do it at all. <laughs> I'm not going to let this thing run for two hours. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Uh, Ceres. So Ceres is in the asteroid belt, which means that it stays pretty close to the ecliptic. Okay. Um, and I'll take away our atmosphere right there. I don't know what pictures Stellarium has for Ceres. Notice the number one up there. That was because it was the first, um, it was the uh, first uh, of these bodies to be discovered that are smaller than our usual planets. Um, so look at that, it's really close to the moon right there. Let's zoom in on it. I don't know if these photographs are gonna be the good ones, but we have sent a spacecraft to orbit around Ceres for a time. So I'm very hopeful. Come on, please, 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 please. Is that as close as we get? That's hilariously disappointing. Darn. Um, there are some good pictures you can find online of this, of this dwarf planet, of this asteroid, um, because the Dawn spacecraft orbited around it for over a year, okay? Um, when it comes to Haumea, Make, Make, and Sir in Eris, no spacecraft has gone up close to them, so there are no good pictures of those. Um, but I can show you where they are in the sky if you'd like. So let me do this as well. So there's our ecliptic, all right? Um, and let's do the first one, Eris. I say first one because it's the largest. 
you see it's apparently the 136,000th on the list right there. Not also that far, look at that. Um, but it's actually a lot farther away um, because of its great distance. And there, you can see that's as close as we're getting there. You're not even seeing actually it's one, uh, it's one known moon, dysnomia right there. Haumea. Wait, Lena, do you remember the names of the uh, moons that orbit Haumea? I think it's Hiaka. Hiaka, I think is what it is. And then um, Namaka. Oh gosh, I've already forgotten. Um, this is not showing fully what you see with Haumea. It probably should look more elongated than this, but yeah, it's just so far away. And remember, like I said, we don't have any close-up pictures of these objects. And then I'll bring up Make Make. So there's Make Make. Yeah. So they're just too far away from us to get really nice close-up images. So now you can see how Stellarium can kind of disappoint in that way. Oh, well. <laughs> how do they look in NASA's eyes or a worldwide telescope? I wonder if they can give you a, a better simulated image. Well, you know, something else that I'm... Oh, good. I thought I was muted there because I was on a different screen. So I have a tiny little monitor here. Um, I was just looking on the um, the NASA JPL photo journal mm. site. That might be something to show real quick, just because it's something where everybody can look for different images. Oh, sure. Yeah. Places within you know under the small bodies category. Excellent it's, point. It's fun to click on that front page and then and and then do searches for the different. There you go. All right, I, I put the link in there. Um, I'm going to continue my little check here just because I thought this would be funny to look for. Um, I want to see what it does in NASA's eyes. <laughs> OK, so NASA's eyes is a little bit more ambitious in terms of what it says Eris looks like. <laughs> sure, why not? It's got those exact craters. Folks, this is, yes, an artistic rendition. They are saying that based off of, of uh, its brightness and how much it reflects light, this is what they estimate it could potentially look like. But again, this is just a guess, all right? And by the way, we are really far out in the solar system right here. We are three, we are about three times farther from the sun than Pluto is right now, okay? Ooh, look at that. That's the solar system right there. That's because Eris takes about uh, 550 years to go around the sun. So it's really far out there. Um, let's see here. What was I promising before? Oh, there, Make Make. Let's, let's see what this one does. And uh, yeah, I knew that Make Make was a really, really red world. Okay. I don't know, Waylina, what's your opinion on that term Tholins when it comes to this that we see here? Hmm. Not a big, not a big opinion or? Not really a big opinion. Okay. Um, the idea is that the, these red chemicals here that gives us red color, it's actually a chemical compound that cannot exist on earth because of our atmosphere. But out here in the coldness of space without much oxygen, uh, the, these chemical compounds, these um, basic hydrocarbons can thrive and they have this neat red color here. Um, and that's what you're seeing right there. Um, let's see here. What's our next one? I was told to uh, show Haumea. Haumea is also out in the Kuiper belt, but I am not seeing it. I don't know. Maybe it's actually just like behind. <laughs> There's Eris over there. I wonder if I did this. Um, is it the question mark one? Ooh, no, I don't want that one. Oh, now I remember. If I turn off everything but the dwarf planets, maybe that will help me. <laughs> All right, let's see this. No, 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 yeah, Sedna is another good one, but, and oh, they got the space probes on still. I'd love to turn those off. There we go. Hmm. What's our current right, comment? It looks like you have a question about precession. Oh, no. Okay. Um, 
Yes, we do have a question about procession. No, that's all right. That's a fine question, Nix. Um, there have been different North Stars in the past and there'll be different ones in the future. So I assume that some of you have seen the movie Inception or some of you have played with a dreidel or just a regular top. And when you spin that top, when it's starting to fall, it wobbles around. Well, that's procession that you're seeing on that top as gravity is pulling on it. Well, as the moon and the sun pull on Earth, it makes Earth spinning wobble as well on a cycle that's really, really, really long, about 26,000 years. So because of that, that wobbling means that our North Pole is not always pointed at Polaris. But for the last several hundred years, it has been pointed at Polaris. But if you go several thousand years in the future, it will be pointed at different stars. Okay, so in the far future, Deneb might be a good North Star or Vega. Those are both stars in, uh, that make up the Summer Triangle. Um, and then if you go far into the past, when the Egyptians built the pyramids, well, uh, the North Star for them was a star in the constellation Draco, Thuban. Okay, it was not what we call Polaris today. And unfortunately, no, there's no bright star right at the point of the South Celestial Pole. So what people in the Southern Hemisphere have done to find that point in the sky directly above the South Pole is they use the Southern Cross. The long end of the Southern Cross is pretty close to being in line with that pole point in the sky. So they always use the Southern Cross as an anchor of navigation in, in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's why you'll find on many flags of countries in the Southern Hemisphere, the Southern Cross on them. Australia's flag has the Southern Cross on it. So does New Zealand. And uh, you'll find it on Brazil and a few other countries as well. Oh, um, I forgot I had NASA's eyes still open. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, I promised I was going to do NASA's eyes in Facebook Live. <laughs> so it's that. Did you find a cool picture in the photo journal um, relating to what you were thinking about or no? I found some were nice of series and but not too many of um, of the others. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a little disappointed, but it was yeah. it's a neat resource to be able nice. to just look for all sorts of um, images for solar system objects because yeah. you can search by what it is that you want to see. You can then search by the exact um, spacecraft, mm -hmm. the exact camera even on the spacecraft and it's drop down menus. So if you don't know nice. what it's called, you can just kind of look through and see what Very it is cool. that uh, it might be called. So it's Excellent. kind of kind of fun that way. Yeah. Waylena, I don't see you right outside the door over here, and I don't see the solar window that bright as what I see behind you. <laughs> well, I, I just said as a background because it took so long to find it, but um, <laughs> in it, there are, and I can't really point to them like, oh, there, 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 there. Um, so <laughs> the image is large enough that I could zoom in on it, and there are... Um, prism, little rainbow prisms. Yes. And you were talking yes. about splitting the light earlier yes. and all that talk of color. It's like, yeah. oh, I know the nicest picture. Yeah. Hmm. And it just took me a moment to, uh, that's okay. to get it onto this computer from my phone. <laughs> I think Ellie is asking for one of your favorite Juno pictures. Mm. She's asking anything. about how, how storms are on Jupiter, how many of them are. I mean, I don't know if we can really count them, but there are a lot and we've seen a lot more now that Juno has been orbiting around Jupiter and looking at its northern and southern poles and also getting really close flybys of Jupiter to get a close look at those storms. And they are humongous and they are pretty, just amazing to catch, okay? Um, and we do see storms on Saturn, on Uranus and on Neptune. On Uranus, it's a lot harder to see because of the haze, but you can see it outside of visible light. But every Jovian planet, because of those clouds that make up their upper atmospheres, they're all subject to having storms. 
Now, even though they're a lot colder, they're not getting a lot of their heat from the sun. Since they don't really have a solid surface right underneath those clouds, their heating of their atmospheres that causes those storms, it's actually coming from the cores of those planets. So the heat that goes and generates our geologic processes like volcanism and stuff, it actually goes into the clouds of those planets instead. Which is pretty wild to think about. Oh, I, I got her to drop her jaw again. Although not as wide. This time it's more of an O. It's, it, it's, a, it's a zero instead of an O. So it's a instead of uh. I have the picture. Awesome. Let's see it. Had to. Because you've put up so many beautiful Juno pictures up on the dome. Yeah, that's a fantastic example right there. Yeah, see, I knew she'd drop her mouth really far for this. <laughs> well, I haven't done annotating in a while. I don't know if this is going to work very well, but I always thought that this part right here looks like a dragon. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, definitely. That's what I've been saying whenever we did showed this in the dome too. You know, that's totally a dragon. There's just so many storms. Uh -huh. and, and oh yeah, yeah, incredible. Yeah, the ovals. And these there. ones are these ones are more sunken down in, uh -huh. so they uh -huh. look darker. And yeah, yeah. These are that this one here just looks like a little hurricane, and yeah. uh, just incredible. And I do wish we could all be looking at it on the dome because it just fills the entire ceiling. It is so incredible. All right. Well, folks, um, I don't know what else. I I feel like I've I, I feel like I've been <laughs> drained of so many comments now. There's just so many things that I've covered tonight. It's been amazing. So yeah, thanks for all that great input that you've offered. These have been great questions tonight. Seriously, um, I'm trying to uh, find a link here because one of our colleagues missed us for tonight. So I'm going to exhort her to uh, to find us on YouTube afterwards. Oh, there it is. Oh, I copied it twice. Look at me being so smart. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it is pretty funny. You got that right next. Okay. Well, folks, um, I will tell you that our next show will be in two weeks. Okay. Um, and it will be our first spring prairie skies of the year. Okay, um, so maybe I'll actually properly talk about the equinox at that night, and then I'll talk about when uh, Easter will be because it's actually based off of the equinox too. That's a smart thing to bring up. Um, but that will be the first of three straight weeks of shows because after that will be our last Kaler Science Lecture of the school year. Um, and that will be when we'll have Dr. Daniel Andruchik uh, giving a talk about nuclear fusion. And that will be followed by Waylina giving what I'm sure will be a great presentation on galaxies for our Prairie Sky Spotlight. Okay. Um, and then it'll be back to me the week after that for another Spring Prairie Skies. Okay. Um, and they will be over Zoom as well. It's actually the exact same webinar link we're using for this. We use these for every single one of our public shows that are for free. And we'll do another little preview of it on Facebook Live to entice you to join us, okay? Um, you can find a full schedule of our shows on our website. Um, so let me put up the calendar and it's got all those links right there, okay? Um, so, we hope you can join us then as well. Uh, but in the meantime, look up and, um, you know, clear skies, folks. All right. Have a good night.